So hi, everybody here. And uh, really, I think it's an amazing privilege. And I just want us all to put really a great hand to the amazing Kalkalis team that pulled together this event and managed to bring 250 of us from Israel to here in New York and really make this happen. Well done. So uh, my name's Fiona, and I have the privilege now of introducing uh, Mitch Garber, who I'm going to be interviewing. Um, Mitch, in addition to being the chairman of uh, Cirque du Soleil, is also the CEO of Caesars Interactive and Caesars Acquisition Group, um, acquisition company, forgive me, and is responsible for both the investment and leasing Israel in leading the exit from the high-tech company in Israel, Playtica. Those of you may know that is the third largest exit out of Israel, $4.4 billion to the large group out of China, led by, Chi uh, by Giant and uh, the investment arm of Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma. Um, over the years, uh, both through Caesars and TPG, um, which Mitch joined in 2009, he has led numerous large-scale investments um, in Israel and internationally. Um, he's a graduate of the Bialik High School in Montreal and uh, McGill University and the University of Ottawa. He's a tremendously strong supporter of the Israeli tech ecosystem, and I think there's no better person to join me now on stage and really talk about what excites us in Israeli tech and how it's contributing to the global scene. So welcome to join me, Mitch. And just to add to that, I found out quietly this morning that Mitch is also fluent in Hebrew, so you've got to be careful with him. <laughs> So, um, Mitch, I mean, you, from Caesars through to Cirque du Soleil and uh, all the many other things, party gaming that you were the CEO of, you know, over the years you've really become a key force in the um, international entertainment group. What drew you to that in the first place? Well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me. I love Israeli conferences where you'll speak at 9.30 or 10.30. <laughs> um, so, no, I think... I, I think... Um, I think like a lot of Israeli tech companies, um, you, fall, you fall into places by accident. You start in one direction and you end up in another direction. Uh, I started off as a lawyer. I started off representing land-based casino companies before there was an internet in the early 1990s. Um, I was a young lawyer that when the internet came, old lawyers didn't understand the internet. And so there was a need for, for what I was doing. And as time went on, I continued to, to be involved. I took Empire Online public on the London Stock Exchange in 2005. Uh, that was Noam Lanier's company, very successfully. And um, the entertainment business has kind of grown uh, for me over time because the gambling business in Las Vegas and elsewhere has become a much lesser part of the revenue. And the entertainment business has become a much larger part of revenue because people have much more to do. Uh, it used to be that you know, a 60-year-old woman would sit for eight hours at a slot machine, and today uh, people are downloading Netflix, playing games on their phones, FaceTiming uh, people, Snapchatting. The, the era of sitting bored doing one activity is over. And so I've gotten more and more involved in, uh, in live entertainment. So, uh, well, then following that one, then what, basically, first of all, what are you looking for? I think that's interesting. Now, you know, staying ahead of the curve is always key, as you've done here. What kind of innovations and technologies are you looking for as you're going out there now and constantly revolutionizing your spaces? Yeah, I think uh, I'll talk a second just about Platika because it will, it will, no, it will lead into uh, what I'm looking for now. Um, when I joined Caesars, the idea was that we were going to legalize poker in the United States and have the World Series of Poker become the, the global leader. And it didn't happen. And in 2010, I realized that um, if we didn't find another digital business that was not gambling related, that my team would leave me because they'd have no chance to make any real money. Um, and I tried to do a deal with um, Zenga and, uh, and Mark Pincus, and he laughed at me and he sent me away, which was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, probably. Um, and the first thing I did was I looked in Israel. It wasn't so much the mobile games or social games business. It was the Israeli mentality that I wanted to acquire into Caesars, knowing that smart, innovative Israelis that have a business plan would figure out a way to grow a business even further. And so the, the decision that I made wasn't so much the choosing of Platika, it was choosing Israel. Finding Platika was also, um, you know, I, I guess, happenstance. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for, here's how I see it. I think Americans um, look at how to make something. And Israelis look at how to make money with something. And this is the number one ideology that I find in Israeli businesses. So someone like me who has a law degree from North America, who thinks in a very structured corporate way, who's been a corporate executive for the last 20 years, shows up in, in Israel and respects and understands 
that the way Israelis do business is exactly the opposite of the way that I've been built, and that if I can marry sort of my structured idea about how to grow a business through M&A, through, um, you know, through, through, through debt, through um, you know, any other private equity, venture capital, uh, and let the Israeli group build a business and figure out how to make more money with it, that combination has proven to be very successful. So I look for really smart management teams that are absolutely hungry for money. And they're not so, they're not so hard to find uh, in, in Israel. But this money-making mentality and monetization mentality, I know it's easy to, you know, people laugh at, uh, it's, it, Israelis, I'm also Israeli, we make fun of, of ourselves, but the truth is that that monetization mentality is unique to, uh, to Israelis, and, uh, and, and I, I try to exploit it in, in a very, you know, fair and kind way. Well, that's always the joke that they say, that if you have two people in Paris that are sitting on a bench talking about, you know, culture and fashion in Israel, you've got those two Israelis, they're always talking about how can they create the next startup. So, um, just on that front, though, you made the, the big Playtico investment. So, how did you find Playtico? What were you going? I mean, you talked a bit about what you liked in Israel, but specifically, how did you source Playtico? And maybe a little bit, if you can talk us through that deal all the way to the great exit. Yeah, so this, this is not a very well known story. It will be now. Um, so, I was crossing the street in New York City after getting lunch with Gigi Levy, and I told Gigi that I wanted to buy the social, uh, the social games business that he had bought inside 888. And uh, he told me that he couldn't sell it for less than he paid for it. His board wouldn't let him sell it for less than he paid for it. And I told him I wouldn't pay him what he paid for it. Um, and he, he, he asked me if I had heard of a company called Playtica, which was very small at the time. Maybe the run rate was, at that time, around 7 million of EBITDA and 13 employees in an apartment office in, in Tel Aviv. And I told him, first of all, I told him I'd never heard of it. Second of all, I confused the name with Playtech, which I had heard of. Um, and then a month went by and he told me that I never called his friends at Playtica. And I forgot. And anyway, I, I, I called him, I flew to Tel Aviv, and I, and I visited, and I met Robert Antikal and Ori Shahak, and I fell in love, and I realized that this was, this was my, my future. And the other thing is, which I think is very sort of anti-Israeli, is that, you know, while Israelis are always looking to pay the lowest possible price, I've taken a very different approach, and I did with Robert Antikal as well, where, you know, I, was, I, I thought the fair price for his business was 85 million, and he thought the fair price was 100 million, and I paid him 100 million, because my goal wasn't to make 15% on that deal. My goal was to make, you know, three times money. It turned into 40 times money, but, you know, I, I try not to be short-sighted enough to try to, you know, to nitpick the small, the small money. If the management team is strong, and there's a real path to profitability and growth, then you can afford to overpay slightly for what the, what the future holds. And that's the story of Playtica. And Robert grew that business. We, 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 we did some M&A. We bought some great companies. We bought a company in Israel called House of Fun run by a guy named Omri Shitri. That when we bought it, it was making $8 million of EBITDA in 2012. This year, it'll make $90 million. So there's a magic to, you know, to taking businesses that have a growth trajectory and marrying them with a team of people that know how to get the most out of that business. And that's the story of Playtica, and it grew to, this year it'll make over 450 million of EBITDA, and it's owned by this Chinese consortium uh, that paid $4.4 billion of cash for it. So I think may, uh, the magic question following that is, how do you find the right buyer for your business? Maybe, do you have any insights vis-a-vis uh, -vis the exit point, or was it just well, a the, few? Yeah, so that's another thing I love about Israeli businesses, uh, which I, f I find different from the North American mentality. The North American mentality in general is people fall in love with their businesses and they pass them on from generation to generation. And Israelis, you know, if, if Israelis were to forget every English word they knew except for two, they would probably keep exit and strategy. And I fully, you know, I, I fully believe that, you know, having an exit strategy, even if you don't exit, is, is, is very, very important to, you know, to the overall strategy of what you're doing in your business. So, you know, building your business through M&A, uh, growing your business to potentially IPO, growing your business um, you know, to potentially sell to private equity. You don't have to do it. But what we did with Robert was we positioned the company to either IPO or sell if there was you know, an opening in the market. And when the market opened, we took advantage of it. Um, we had a bit of an auction, actually. We had 17 companies interested in buying Playtica. So it, it worked out very, very well for us. So um, I know, I don't know if anyone else knows, you really are a frequent traveler to Israel. You, even I heard you mentioning you've spent a year living in Israel at some point. What are you looking for today? Like when you're looking ahead, what are you looking to complement? Not just the culture, but really the kind of themes that are interesting. What kind of startups um, that appeal to you these days? So 
yeah, I've never, um, I've never invested in a startup. And I don't, you know, no, I don't, I don't consider, you know, uh, Playtica having been a startup. When we finally bought it, it was making $10 million of EBITDA, and that's a great sweet spot, uh, you know, a company that's, that's either proven that it can make profit or that it will make profit, that has a strong management team. And if that management team can acknowledge its weaknesses and you can acknowledge its strengths, that's what I'm looking for. So I think, I, I keep using Robert as an example, but Noam Lanier is another example, someone who, you know, is not corporately structured. Uh, does not necessarily operate well in large corporate groups. So if you're going to grow to 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 employees, that maybe you do need some help. If you're going to do sophisticated M&A, if you're going to raise uh, debt or, or equity, that maybe you do need help. And what I found in the, in the investments that I've made is that management really didn't want to go on the road. They didn't want to go to board meetings. They didn't want to do debt financing. They wanted to build their business and let you do that stuff. And that stuff's very important. And it's very important for them to continue to build the business. So I'm looking for strong management teams that believe that they can build their business to 10x what it is today and don't want to be bothered by all of the corporate stuff that's necessary to really get to that billion dollar valuation and that ultimate exit. Oh, brilliant. So maybe as a, a parting word, uh, maybe what are the trends that you're seeing in terms of what's complementing your industry and you know, how we all fold into those uh, trends going ahead, let's say the next five or 10 years in your business? Or two to three, to be honest. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, first of all, it's a, it, 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 only in an Israeli conference can someone hold a sign to you, Aaron, saying your time is up, get off the stage. It's, which is also what I love. Which is also what I love about uh, uh, about Israeli businesses is there's no there's no sort of um, default respect for leadership. You have to earn earn your leadership. Uh, but Aaron mentioned he mentioned Shmona Matayim. And it was an incredibly important part of every Israeli investment that I've made is that component. Uh, but that component has to be well married with the, with the business and, and corporate and, and, and growth component. So I think you know, what I'm seeing mostly is probably defense related innovation that, may, that probably won't be used for defense, but it was developed for defense. And what, what we need to do is sit in, in a room with businesses and reinvent them. There's a lot of startups in Israel that have great core competence and great core technology and need to be reinvented. And the reinvention of these businesses um, is, 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 is very, very important. And that's the marriage which you basically bring to the table, which I think is... I amazing. hope so. I have very good partners. I'm partners with a, a gentleman named Mark Cohen, who's a very well-known philanthropist and one of the founders of Apollo. Um, and, and, and a, a billionaire who lives here in, in New York. And his interest is in doing what we did with Playtica. Again, we were partners in the Playtica deal. He, he bought Beats, and he sold Beats to Apple, but he saw the path to selling Beats to Apple before he bought Beats. So, you know, having a Zionist who, who's committed to investing in Israel and has the vision towards a path to exiting these businesses is a dream come true for me. So I'm in Israel once a month, and I'm hoping to spend a lot even more time than that. Well, that was amazing. I think it's, we should have more people like Mitch for us all. Thank you. Thank you for everything.